Hello and welcome to the Retro Hour podcast, episode number 77, your weekly dose of retro gaming and technology news with me, Dan Wood. And me, Ravi Abbott. Oh, and I've been looking forward to this week's show. Oh, it's been a good one. I've seen you put little teasers out on Facebook. Now, obviously, on this podcast every week, we like to bring you not only the latest goings on in the world of retro gaming and technology, but also we strive to bring you an absolute legend, a veteran of the video games industry. Somebody who's just going to tell us a really interesting story and maybe clear up a few myths and give us kind of an insight into, like, video game history and culture. And if you want to tick all those boxes, our guess that we've got this week doesn't come much bigger. No, this guy's fantastic. Howard Scott Warshaw, you know, he's the first guy to actually have his name written as a designer yeah. on the Atari game, and that was Yars Revenge. Also, Raiders of the Lost Ark he did with Steven Spielberg and the legendary E.T., which, if you've seen the film Atari <laughs> Game Over, you will know it was buried in a desert and kind of became the thing of myth and legend. It's got the title, The Worst Video Game Ever. Yeah, so that's why we're going to really talk about it and actually find out if it was the worst video game ever. Now, because this is a bit of a first on our show, because this interview is so in-depth, and also Howard's writing a book, so he kind of said to us, look, guys, you can interview me, but I want everything in there, and I want, I want to use it for my book, you know, his notes and that kind of stuff. We were like, you know, more than happy to do that. So we actually caught up with him over two weeks. So what we're going to do is run this in two separate parts. Yeah, because there's so much good stuff here, like Yars Revenge alone. We kind of don't want to cut that out and just go straight to E.T. in the desert and all the stuff that you've seen in Atari Game Over. We want the full story, mm-hmm. the kind of extra bits, and we're going to give you that. So this week's episode is going to be all the way up to E.T. And then next week it's going to be E.T. afterwards, you know, the kind of burial, <laughs> the, um, <laughs> the video, resurrection. The video yeah. games crash of North America that he was blamed for yeah, by many yeah, people, yeah. you know. Such an interesting guy. If it was up to me, I'd run this over about eight weeks. Because he's yeah, so interesting. He just keep but, doing interviews. <laughs> but, you know, this week, though, we're going to catch up with him um, when he's in his office between meetings. Next week, we're going to get him on the road when he's driving across California. So, yeah. just so interesting. Howard Scott Warshaw, an absolute pioneer and a legend, is coming up as special guest on this week's Retro Hour podcast in just a bit. And also, it's been a pretty manic week. I got myself a new job this week. Oh no, you're going to leave us. It's going to be the Ravi Retro Hour all on my own. You've been thinking of that title for a while. I yeah, can I've, I've been planning it. That rolled off the tongue a bit too easy. <laughs> <laughs> now, you know, for regular listeners and those that you know may watch my YouTube channel and be involved in like you know the Retro and Amiga community, it might not be much of a surprise because you know I've been a massive you know fan of this project and evangelising this you know since I first set my eyes on it. But this is Friend Up. Now, this stands for the Friend Unifying Platform, and it kind of takes a lot of inspiration from the best bits of the Amiga, drags it into the 21st century, and essentially, if you want you know, a really short explanation of what it is, it turns the internet into your computer. Yeah, it's, it's, I've been beta testing it, and it's a, it's a cloud-based kind of desktop, mm-hmm. basically, that's all in HTML5, and it's very fast and very impressive but also it runs applications from everything. So you could have, you know, an Amiga emulator in there. You could integrate a Mega Drive emulator, just drag the dr- the ROM over, drop it into your browser, and then boom. You know, it's a really nice system. And anybody that kind of has this problem, I've always got this problem where I'm logging onto Facebook on every single computer, and then people are like, right, I'm going to frape him at work or something. <laughs> so this kind of keeps all your stuff in a nice encrypted place as well, and you can just log in and log out wherever yep. you are. Luckily, at the time of recording this, it's time quite well because version 1.0.0, that you know, everyone can try, and the source code's coming out on GitHub. This is an open source project, and uh, it should be released this weekend. And, you don't and you're that. probably wondering, why are we talking about this? Why is this relevant mm-hmm. to our podcast? And it's because of the people that they have on board. You know, this is based on a kind of Amiga-like system, but everything's going to work on it. They're going to have Windows, they're going to have Mac applications working on there. There's going to be integration with Google Drive, Dropbox. It's really fantastic. And you've been playing Quake 3 in it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> All of those kind of modern titles. Yeah. So, I mean, yeah, really, you know, the, the thing that really got my interest in it originally is because it was demoed at Amiga 30 and Hogno, the guy who was really, you know, the main guy behind it, he's been a massive Amiga nut since he was a teenager. He said, you know, an Amiga 4000, he's an old school Amiga hacker. Well, the then. name itself, isn't it? Friend. You yeah. know, Amigo, 
friend. Yeah, exactly. That's a connection. And David Pleasance, who uh, used to be the MD of Commodore UK, and Colin Proudfoot are involved in this project as well. Wow. I mean, for me as a kid who grew up reading about them in magazines and stuff, if you'd have told me like 20, 25 years later, I'll be working alongside these guys, that would have been, you know. It's amazing. And I think the main problem with this is because I've been beta testing it and I actually know how to use it now. And the main problem is getting the message across because I don't <laughs> think it's been explained that well. It's been explained very engineering and techy like. That is where I come in. So yeah. <laughs> I'm, just, I'm working with the guys on a freelance basis at the moment, you know, so hopefully you're going to be seeing a lot more of FriendUp around. And I, you know, implore everybody to give it a go. Uh, the website is friendup.cloud. And just like Ravi's been doing, if you're into coding and development and stuff like that, this is a good platform where you can get in there nice and early, get games ported to it. You know, there's going to be so much coming up. I wish I could tell you what's coming up in the future, but... Yeah, I'm planning on diving the whole new... WordPress website on there. Yeah. Yeah. yeah lots of stuff. All for retro out. hours, so it should be so, great. And it's open source, so, you know, do with it whatever you like. So. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> I put a link to that in our show notes, but I thought I'd, you know, share my exciting news this week because working with, like, you know, Amiga Legends for an Amiga fanboy like me. It's yeah, I'm, I'm just wondering, is he going to be so dedicated to the podcast? <laughs> yeah, you're doing it on your own next week, right? <laughs> That's it. But yeah. you know what? Me and Joe. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm not the only person that loves Commodore and the Amiga. I know lots of our audience are, you know, old, old time Commodore fans. Maybe you've got memories of rushing home from school and playing Lemmings or getting all your mates together and playing Nick Plus. Those were the days, weren't they? Oh, yeah. But you know what? You might not have your original hardware anymore. And you might get a bit nostalgic listening to this show. Because everyone always says to us, you make me spend money. <laughs> so this week, we're going to give you an easy way to play those old classics. Because we've got a competition for an amazing new version of Amiga Forever and Commodore 64 Forever. Version 7. Now, this has been 18 months in the making. Yeah, and this has been kindly donated by Calanto and Mike Batalana. And this is just fantastic software. I use it at home, and it's mm. great. Um, you can kind of emulate, but really easily. Just double-click on stuff, boom, it loads up straight away. There's also a lot of improvements in this version. So they've got PowerPC support, so you can run OS 4.1 in your on your Windows machine, kind of run a PowerPC. PC operating system, which is great. It's got multi-monitor support, you know, more controller support, but it's also got this amazing auto start thing. So you can turn your PC into an Amiga just from the start, yeah. maybe even a C64. <laughs> so you can <laughs> have your multi-core beast and just press it. <laughs> it won't boot quite as fast as a Commodore 65, but, yeah. but you know. But yeah, it's an amazingly slick package. I mean, I've been using Amiga forever since, God, about 2005, I think 2006, got my first version of it. And again, it's kind of, if you want to take all the headache out of emulation, all the ROMs are included. I think the, you know, the C64 forever, it also does all the Commodore 8 bits, 128. I think it's got 300 games or something with it, like, yeah. 300 um, bits of software. And, you know, just Commodore Plus for all those 8-bit machines. It even has a cool little feature in there where it will actually put up as your Facebook or Skype status what game you're playing right now. <laughs> That's cool. Now playing. Yeah, Ravi is playing Gianna Sisters. So, oh, you know, yeah. If you want to just do, you know, Commodore and Amiga emulation really simply, these packages are really slick. And as we said, we've got five copies of a bundle. So this includes Amiga Forever and Commodore 64 Forever. We'll give you a couple of keys to download them legally from Mike, obviously. So uh, if you want to enter this competition, you've got a fortnight to do it. All you have to do is head to our website, theretrohour.com, and answer this very simple question. Which CPU does the Commodore 64 use? MOS 6510? The Z80? Intel 80... 86. So it's one of those three. All you've got to do is head to our website. You'll find the form on the front page, theretrohour.com. All the terms and conditions are on there. The competition closes on Friday the 14th of July at 23.59. We're going to close entries then. After that, we'll pick out five winners at random and you will each receive a bundle of Amiga Forever and Commodore 64 Forever 7. Not bad. Wow. Worth about 35 quid, actually, so pretty good. I've got a little correction. I'm sorry. You got something wrong, Ravi. Oh, I got that something wrong last week. Yeah, it does more than you know, guys. <laughs> <laughs> um, we were talking about Wipeout game. Yeah. And, you know, I was saying, oh, there's this version for the PC. And my friend played it and all this. Completely wrong. It's for the PS4. And what he was playing was Formula Fusion, which is a new kind of Wipeout-based game. Okay. And it's on the Steam store. 
So check that out, guys, if you've got a PC. <laughs> yeah, he said last week, and I was like, really? I sat on the, on the PC, I was looking around, I was like, I can't find it anywhere. Yeah. So no. th- thank you, Michael Wynn, for pointing that out as well. Yeah, cheers. <laughs> so before we get into this week's news and uh, the interview with Howard Scott Warshaw, we want to say also a massive, massive thank you to those who uh, give to us and help us keep doing the show for you every single week, and those are our very kind donators. And if you do make a donation to the Retro Hour podcast, that automatically gets your place in the Retro Hour Hall of Fame. And we want to say a huge thank you this week for your donations. Barry Jack. Chris Cowland. Paul Edwards. And Shumez Av Duchniki, who all made donations to the Retro Hour podcast through our website, theretrohour.com. If you'd like to do the same, you will help keep this show going week in, week out, and that you'll find a little PayPal link and a Bitcoin link as well on the front page of theretrohour.com. Right, let's get into some news, shall we? Yep. It's been a big week for Nintendo fans. Oh, God, this has been everywhere. The uh, SNES Mini. We kind of all knew it was coming, though, didn't we? Yeah, we did talk about this a while back. Um, but it is coming out in September. They've announced it's going to be released. And it's going to be released, um, they've only given an American price so far, but $80 it costs. <laughs> well, I saw I saw a hilarious thing on uh, Larry Bundy's yep. um, Facebook. Which Guru was, Larry. Yeah, which was saying... Ah, uh, confirmed. It's it's got the yellowing in it <laughs> to make it seem positive, and he'd Photoshop the image to kind of have a yellow top <laughs> to make it look like moldy teeth yellow. Yeah. <laughs> I wonder if it will happen with the plastics. You think they'll learn, like you know, how to? Yeah, how to do by, like, by now, yeah, I, I guess. Think. Guess we'll find out in twenty five years. But you know, I've been seeing some people have kind of kind of been whinging a bit about this, going, "Oh, you know, it's twenty dollars more expensive than the the NES Mini was." Mm. But if you look at the list of games they've got here now, not only. Um, do you get 21 games included? Obviously, it's all in a nice little modern package. HDMI out, so you can play it on a modern TV as well. But, I mean, there are some massive titles on oh, here. F-Zero. I bloody loved F-Zero. That was a great game. Donkey Kong Country, Final Fantasy Wait, 3. Was Star Fox 2 not released? or was that yeah. the, Ah, that's that's the one that Ben Hex got on this show, and he's always like, look at my Star Fox 2. Uh. Well, he's not the only one who's got yeah. it now. <laughs> well, they were developing this, and then obviously when the N64 came along, they kind of moved development to that. Yeah, because they had to have that special chip on the actual car. Uh, Super FX. Yeah. yeah. yeah so. Well, this is on there, so essentially you get an, a previously unreleased SNES game from Nintendo included. Finished, yeah. Yeah, completely finished and, you know, polished up and everything. Street Fighter 2, Turbo, Hyper Fighting's on here, Super Mario Kart, Super Mario World, Yoshi's Island, that was kind of like, I remember Baby Mario in that and used yeah. to cry all the time. Earthbound as well, if, if you want a copy of Earthbound, that's going to cost you so much, so this is a good way of playing yeah, it. Yeah, people are whinging that it's $80. If you to buy all these on cartridge and the original, <laughs> it costs you about 500 quid at least. Well, do you think they're going to have um, the extension leads uh, do you think they're going to be longer that's the main question than the NES ones because they were tiny yeah they, yeah I mean I, I hope they've kind of listened to complaints from the NES Mini and I think you know one thing I have heard is there's not going to be the stock shortages that there was with the the NES Mini yeah I'm sure they, w- they won't make that mistake but then I guess they've been planning this for ages because they kind of had the NES Mini cut it everyone's like why did you cut it and then we knew the NES is coming do you think there's going to be an N64 Mini Almost certainly. Oh, there's got to be, be beautiful. an annual thing. I wonder where they'll get up to though. Whether they'll get to like the Wii or, but you know, what I've been reading quite interestingly. This uh, SNES... a little Wii. <laughs> <laughs> Speak for yourself. <laughs> <laughs> but this uh, SNES Mini is apparently more powerful than a Wii. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the system on a chip is essentially you know it's clocked faster. It's got you know a better CPU than the actual Wii itself has. Maybe you could do some uh, dodgy firmware hacks or something. And I'm get sure some... that'll happen. Yeah, <laughs> but you know, I think you know for me. I'm not that interested in this system because I've got a SNES with an EverDrive anyway. Mm. But for someone who just wants to kind of recapture their youth again and play these classic games, I think these are brilliant. And all the upscaling. You know, know, the the fact that it does it really nice in the HDMI output and everything, you haven't got bother with converters. Yeah, and I think, you know, based on the amount of interest that the, the NES Mini got, this is going to be, you know, it's just going to print money for Nintendo. Yeah, they've just really realised that the kind of retro market actually does work. And they're going through their whole range. I think Sega should do this. (laughs) Well, also they've been saying that the the virtual um, store on the on the Switch is not far away now. That's meant to be launching this summer as well, so that could be massive. You know, I mm-hmm. imagine having all SNES and N64 games that you can play on the Switch on the go. Oh, yeah. It's going to be huge. Now, speaking of, you know, places where you might buy your SNES Mini from, there is a certain high street store here in Britain that, for some reason, everyone seems to hate. It's probably game, isn't it? There's no others. <laughs> it is game, yeah. Well, this is on yeah, kotaku.co.uk. They've done this article, and it's called Why Does Everyone Hate Game? 
Now, this is because Game have actually launched an elite membership program, which costs £33 a year. And all the comments on this were everyone saying, oh, forget Game, we hate you, we wouldn't shop in there if you paid us. And, you know, this is kind of an article examining what they've done wrong and kind of the demise of game shops. They've sucked the soul out of game shops. I went in there the other day. It was just full of amiibos. The PC section was like two nice keyboards just chucked at the bottom, and then bloody cardboard cards with redeem codes on them. There yeah. wasn't even any games. It was just like you buy a little bit of cardboard, Gary, you might as well do it at home. It's well, there's like... the irony. I went to buy a game. I think I was looking for Zelda in there. And I went the girls, like, oh, we haven't got any in, but you can download it. And I'm like, what? Well, <laughs> yeah. you, you know, you realise you just lost like a 55 quid, quid sale by saying that. Yeah. It's like, you can see why they went bankrupt a couple of years ago in many ways. But again, you mentioned there about, you know, the Amiibos and stuff, and you walk in, it's like they've got shelves for those pop figures now. And yeah, yeah. Half the store's dedicated to like tat, <laughs> essentially, isn't it? Not games. But it's interesting to look back. I mean, this article kind of examines the history of game. And obviously, there's been so many buyouts. You remember like Future Zone. Yeah. and Electronics Boutique and Game Station um, that have kind of all merged into one company, you know, over time. It actually turns out that it is Electronics Boutique bought Game in the early 2000s. It wasn't the other way around. Oh, oh, really? Why did they not style themselves as Electronics Boutique then? Because that place was bloody good, I remember. It, it was something to do with an American company had like a 25% stake in the name, so oh. it was cheaper for them just to rebrand Electronics Boutique as Game, not the other way around. So essentially this company that we're hating on now is Electronics Boutique. Well, well, it's pretty weird as well, because I, I went past there the other day and all I saw in the windows, there was no promos for games or anything. There was just stacks of, like, tablets and stuff like yeah. that, second-hand ones that people had traded in. Yeah, phones and, it, and, and stuff. And it was like, is this a porn shop or is this, like, you know, a gaming retailer? It's looking more like CEX every time you go yeah, past, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, but the Independents, we go to the Independents in our city, they've got cases displaying odysseys and you know you've got like mega drive shelves and it, they're great you know and I, they're just they're just doing it wrong i think well i used to love game station as well before they went under but i you know this article is really interesting this guy talks about how he used to go to uh you know future zone back in the early 90s mm. and he said he'd go into his local one and on the wall there'd be like you know massive spray paintings of sonic and mario yeah yeah and i remember you get all that i was chatting my mate about this you know we, we go out on a saturday and kind of electronics boutique would be a place where all the kids would go. On a Saturday, the place would be packed and they'd have all the game systems out. Yeah, you could spend hours just going in there, picking something off a shelf, and you go, oh, do you remember this one? Do you remember that? And you just do that <laughs> like, yeah. for hours. You might pick up three or four cheap games, but, uh, you know, you'd, you'd spend a lot of time in there and they'd have a lot of footfall. Well, that's the thing. I mean, you go in them now and they're like, there's no one in. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It, it, it kind of reminds me of video shops, you know, when video shops kind of blockbuster started to get empty yeah on the demise <laughs> yeah i mean you know you mentioned here that you know these days there's no pictures of mario or sonic you walk past the front they look like a show home it's <laughs> well, true isn't it it's well my experience is very different i remember um these were kind of the amiga game shops that i used to go to and they independent ones this after the amiga's demise was after the, the demise and, okay. and i'd kind of go in there and i'd, I'd go after going to the green grocers to get some stuff for my dad and there'd be like a fat bloke there with all his dinner running down his top <laughs> like he'd just <laughs> eating it and he'd be like oh, do, you, do you want the new copy of Leisure Suit Larry <laughs> and it was just like really dodgy it was funny though he sounds like a character out of Leisure Suit Larry yeah. <laughs> I remember my mate ran up and said Amiga's dead and the guy actually chased him down the road like no it's not you know refusing to accept it throwing his dinner at it yeah, yeah. But, I mean, this article also mentions, you know, that games price has dropped now. It's only worth about, the shares are 33 pence a share at the moment. Oh dear. And said that last year in America, 74% of game-related sales were digital. Well, is that GameStop connected with game as well, then? Huh? I don't think they're the same, no, but I, I know they do get the same reputation in America, don't they? Yeah, Everyone because takes cause there was that whole thing about them using retro cartridges and they were ripping all the packaging and boxes out and then leaving the cartridges loose. Yeah. It's like, what are you doing? It's sad to say, but... You got it spot on there when you said it's like the final days of Blockbuster. Mm. Sad as it sounds, I i mean, it might not be a sad thing. You know, maybe the games, you know, the days of game shops like I, game I just are going. Think, I just think they're, they're marketing it incorrectly because mm. you go to like Sex, well, CEX, and. You got it, Sex, I think. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You go there and you've got the whole 
diversity. You've got gamer nerds in there. You've got like heroin addicts trying to sell <laughs> some stuff. You've got a full range, but it's busy, yeah. you know, and you can get some good bargains in there. So. Whenever you go in sex, there's always like a girl with blue hair with a nose piercing, guaranteed. Yeah. Always yeah. working in there. Always guys, you know, that are a bit lanky that haven't showered for a week wearing black t-shirts. Yeah, yeah. And always some dude at the front who's trading in about 50 DVDs. <laughs> That's like, it, like, yeah. The Q behind him. Some bloke with a big TV or something. <laughs> like. But you can buy decent graphics cards in there. You can buy really nice titles they'll have all the old playstation stuff there it's good i'll be overpriced but yeah, yeah. it is cool to go in and have a browse at least but it's uh, definitely busier than game yeah even granger games and stores like that that we've got up here i mean i know they're all over the country but you know playtime we've got here a lot i think the independent game shops yeah. are much more exciting now and maybe it wouldn't be a bad thing if game kind of well, you know, well by again. i know we're going on about this a bit but like mm. with playtime you you couldn't get the PlayStation VR anywhere from any of the other retailers, and the independent actually had the choice of buying a few and actually selling it to yeah. you. So, and I go there for all the VR games now because he's got more than like game have. Yeah, yeah. So, definitely support your local indie shop. I mean, we've said that on this show for you know since day one, pretty much, haven't we? So, yeah, a new company will take over game, and they'll become something else. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. More amiibos. Yeah. <laughs> Now, this is uh, another story that we had quite a lot of people sending us, actually, this week. I want to say a massive thank you. Andy Baxter, he was the first one who uh, messaged through with this. Sega Forever bringing retro games to iOS and Android for free. Now, this like, kind of like fo- everything? Well, that, oh. at the moment, I think it's only five oh. to begin with. But this kind of follows on from you know, the story we did about Crazy Taxi being mm. free and being ad-supported. Ad-ridden. So what they're doing is you essentially download this uh, package, which is Unity-based. And at the moment, they've got just uh, five Mega Drive games mm. um, that you can get through this um, Sega Forever store. Sonic the Hedgehog, Fantasy Star 2, uh, Comic Zone, Kid Chameleon, and Altered Beast, you know, what is the original pack-in. Um, and obviously, Crazy Taxi launched in May. That's kind of included in this now as well. But the showing, if you look at the graphics, they've got Sega Saturn in there. They've got Master System, you know, Game Gear. Even the SG-1000 is there too. So I think Sega are looking at this to be a platform where eventually, you know, they're probably going to try and get as many of their old games on as possible. Like the kind of ultimate mobile gaming Sega platform, everything's on there. But there's been a couple of problems with the launch. You know, they're saying that they've they've done this in Unity because it adds nice features like cloud saving, controller support, leaderboards and all of this. But if you remember, they had Sonic CD, which was out on Android and out on other phones. And that was a bloody good port. I, I, I think I bought it about four times in different Google accounts. It was really good. And uh, that was a dedicated emulator that did it. Now, this one's had a lot of problems with kind of glitches and, you know, music sounding a bit off and stuff like that. And they're saying, Sega are saying, it's because of the diversity in the range of phones. And I think it's because they haven't got their Unity emulator sorted yet. That's the thing, I mean... I remember running Mega Drive emulators on my PC in, like, 2000. Yeah, yeah. Surely Sega can make a decent Mega Drive emulator. That's it, yeah. On, like, an eight-core phone. <laughs> like, you know what I mean? It's... And it's not that much diversity. You've got Android and you've got iOS. Yeah. And all iOS phones are one platform. They're exactly the same. Yeah, I doubt this is support for, like, BlackBerry or anything like that. Yeah, very so. unlikely. Uh, but, I mean, it is, it's just been launched this week. Hopefully they'll be listening to feedback and... At the moment, I mean, they are ad-supported, but you can also unlock them and get rid of all the adverts for £2. But then they're saying that's not working. So people are paying £2 to unlock all the ads and they're still getting ads. (laughs) So (laughs) they need to sort it a bit. But potentially it's a really good platform to have a library of all of the old games. Yeah, it, it is really cool that there's kind of one place that you can go, a destination. Of course, there's nothing worse than hearing about something that's been ported to like a phone platform. And you're like, I didn't know that was on there. Yeah. <laughs> and then like you search and it's been out for like three years. Of course, there is that much in like the Play Store and the, the App Store, isn't there? That's it, yeah. It's absolutely crazy. And you know, they say half of the apps in the App Store have never been downloaded. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I think it was more than half I heard. Something like there's a thousand a day get uploaded. Most of the time, it's just out there in the wilderness. So I think having one destination for Sega fans mm. where they can just go, and I'm sure Sega will listen to feedback on this. They're not going to oh, be yeah, the Sega platform. You know, the beauty of that is that they can just do an update and roll it out, and then all of these issues are fixed. Yeah. <laughs> not like back in the day. No. <laughs> <laughs> so if you're doing a download, that will put a link in this week's show notes at theretrohour.com. All right, well, thank you for checking out episode number 77 of the Retro Hour podcast. We'll be out again next Friday, of course, from all of your favorite podcast clients, including the... Uh, 
the podcast store on iOS. Not quite on the Play Store just yet because it's still not out in the UK. Oh, they're taking their time, aren't they? Uh, and you've been doing some great reviews. Thanks, guys. We're up to 60 now on iTunes, so that's fantastic. And uh, if you could try another format as well, Stitcher. We never get anything on Stitcher. Yeah, you know, leave a YouTube comment if you listen on there as well. We're on so many different platforms. And I'm thinking, because of the guests that we've got on this week, Howard Scott Warshaw, you know, it would be nice to see lots of, you know, nice thumbs up and comments and maybe get the show uh, up in the iTunes chart. Oh, what, yeah, what I'm sure it will. Number three was our peak, wasn't it? Yeah, that was Eugene Jarvis. Yeah. It? Can we get to number two? What? Ooh, well, we, can, we can try. <laughs> That's down to you guys. Yeah. So, listen, thank you so much for checking us out. We'll see you again next week. And now, here he is, part one of one of the most interesting interviews, not only that we've ever done, that I've ever heard, actually. This yeah, guy's I, I could have just done it for a week. <laughs> I just sat there talking to him every day. Here he is. The legend is Howard Scott Warshaw on the Retro Hour. And we'll see you next week. Ciao. You're listening to the Retro Hour podcast and it is time to welcome on this week's very special guest. We are honoured to be joined by the amazing Howard Scott Warshaw. Welcome to the show. Well, it's great to be here. Thank you very much for having me. Really appreciate you joining us. Now, this is a question we like to ask all of our guests because we always get some really interesting answers. So where did it all begin for you? What was your first ever experience with a computer? Uh, Well, that is an interesting question for me because for me, it all started at Tulane University in New Orleans in about 1976, late 76. I was... uh, We... I. And when I was in high school in Scotch Plains, New Jersey, we had an unusual opportunity because we actually had a remote terminal to a computer at Rutgers University. And we had an opportunity to program an APL, an old style language, and could have written programs. And some of my friends did. I did not. I specifically avoided dealing with computers in any way like the plague. I just didn't want to get involved with them. And at some point in college, it sort of became inevitable. So I started a... uh, a computer course. I walked in the middle of a computer course because somebody told me you really need to have some computer stuff. So I I convinced the teacher to let me walk in in the middle of a 14 week semester. And he said, okay, sure. You know, here's the book, you know, go, you know, we're at this point. And so I went to the computer lab and that evening I did the first half of the course. And the (laughs) next day I finished the course. So I finished that 14-week course in two nights and basically said, holy crap, this is exactly what I always would have wanted to do. I had no idea it was this much fun and, and so easy and, and finally a place I don't have to do all this crazy reading. I don't have to write papers. I can just write programs and solve puzzles and problems. And I thought, that's it. I'm hooked. So was that the kind of time you decided, I want to work in computers forever? This is the kind of area I want to go into? I don't know if I had thought it through that far. I just knew that, you know, because I was in school still. I was in the middle of a combination math and economics major, which I still finished. But I just realized, holy crap, this computer stuff is so much better in terms of something to study than anything else. This is where I need to wind up. Well, initially, I mean, uh, was it was it more serious applications that you were coding then rather than games? Absolutely. Well, my first job uh, in computers was not at Atari. My first job in computers was at Hewlett Packard hmm. doing uh, international networking, uh, the X25 protocol, as they say, which is ancient history at this point. Yeah, this was the beginning of the Internet. Hmm. And uh, I was there. Must have been- I mean, I don't rise to Al Gore's level of contribution, but I did my part. <laughs> It must have been kind of revolutionary then. Uh, kind of, uh, did you stumble across the video games industry then? Well, I'll tell you what. You see, because the origin of my involvement with video games uh, actually slightly predates the origin of my involvement with computers. Because, and it wasn't that there were. I mean, I we had a Magnavox Odyssey system at home when I was in high school, and that was okay. It was a little Pong action, nothing really significant, but. For some reason, before I ever had the concept of working in games or, or even working with computers, I don't know why this came to be the way it was, but I was sitting in a Calculus 3 course, which was a uh, three-dimensional calculus. And this was before I even had the episode with the computer science thing. And what happened was I'm sitting in this class, and we're studying uh, directed derivatives. 
and uh, calculating on a surface, on an undulating surface in space. And so it was very abstract math, and I was kind of into the math, and it was interesting stuff. But for some reason, when we were in, I'm sitting in the middle of this class, and what I realized, it just sort of hit, struck me. I thought, you know, it's really interesting because you can describe this entire surface with one simple equation, which could look like uh, a landscape. And I thought with the directed derivative of this thing, it's anywhere if you know your position on this landscape, you can tell your angle of elevation and your direction of view, and you can calculate the projection into the function, you know, into the whole thing. So it would be like, it's sort of like if I'm walking around on a landscape I, and I'm looking through binoculars, I can calculate what I would see in the binoculars just by knowing my position on the function. And for some reason, what that said to me is, oh, so if someone climbs a hill in that thing, I could see them climbing the hill and they could see me down in the valley. And I thought, oh, that would be a really easy way to run a multi-terminal game where you know people are running around and I can see them and they can see me depending on where I am. And the amount of information, because all you need is someone's position information and a little bit of status information and the function, which they all share. And I thought, wow, for a very little amount of information that you'd have to share between the terminals so it solves a communication problem, you could have you know, a multiplayer game with everybody in a real 3D environment that would behave normally, and all the calculations are perfectly doable through calculus. So wow. I realized you could have a tank game, basically. And you plotted all this in your head and, years before. Yeah. Yeah, that's crazy. And that just kind of came to me. And then I just went on with the lesson. But I just realized, you know, oh, that's kind of cool. You know, you could do all that stuff. <laughs> now, at this point, I didn't even realize I'd never programmed a computer. I never played with a computer. I never did anything in data communications, which I did a lot of work in subsequently. But for some reason, obviously, I was attuned to that sort of thing. <laughs> Because, you know, games are always interesting to me. I mean, I always enjoyed entertainment and games. But I don't know why, but in that calculus course, it all came together in my head. And I just realized, oh, you could totally do it like a tank game like this. And you could make it realistic. You know, you could make it like, you know, if I climb a hill, I can see everyone around there. But they can all see me, you know. And it's, it would have a real strategic uh, validity to it that I thought was cool. Uh, it's hard for me to explain because it would be... It would still be a while before I even really saw an arcade video game. And it would still be years before the concept of actually being involved in making a game would actually come up. I mean, that was literally years away for me at that point. The whole concept was there. So you could say, you know, I was someone who was always on my way to doing computer video games. Well, when did you first see a computer video game then? Uh, I first saw, I mean, I'd heard about them. But I didn't go to arcades. I didn't do any stuff like that. I spent a lot of time studying and I just, you know, screwing around with friends and stuff. I had some friends who were starting to get into it. I think, like I said, a home game, I had played some very trivial home games. Uh, the first time I actually saw someone playing uh, a game was probably in a Blimpies, which was a sandwich shop in New Orleans. Hmm. It was right around that same time frame. That was probably 76 or 77. I walked in and I saw someone actually playing the game. And then I saw, I looked at what was going on and I watched what was happening. And I looked at that and I just thought, this is going to be really big. This is going to be, <laughs> this is going to be really big. I mean, it was just one console sitting in one sandwich shop. I just took one look. I just thought, you know, holy crap, this stuff is going to be incredible. This is going to be enormous. I just had these kind of thoughts. I just look at that. And then I went back to doing my own stuff. I mean, there was no thought of me being involved with it. It was just, yeah, I could see these, I could conceptualize creating the games uh, from a technical standpoint. And when I saw the games, I thought, oh yeah, this is going to be huge. I could see this was going to, this is definitely where it was at. And I, although I didn't start playing them right away, I could see eventually I probably would. And all of this is uh, uh, easily four years before I showed up at Atari. Well, how did you make that? That path to Atari then, what was kind of the transition from you just, you know, like looking at it from afar to actually being at like, you know, the core of the industry then? Because obviously it's, Atari was huge. Well, again, it was a very abstruse kind of, uh, I sort of fell into it. Hmm. 
Uh, I was working at Hewlett Packard. That's where I started working out of college in Cupertino in California, right, you know, next door to Sunnyvale, which is where Atari was. And I was kind of a zoo case. You know, I was a pretty, I was a pretty wild and crazy guy <laughs> back then. And uh, not that I'm not particularly wild and crazy now, but I was a very wild and crazy guy, particularly at a place like Hewlett Packard. And uh, so people would go home and they would tell Howard stories from some of the stuff I would do during the days acting up. And one of the guys came into me one day and he said, you know, he goes, I was telling my wife some of the stuff that you do. And uh, she said, this sounds just like what everybody does where she works. <laughs> and I said, oh, where's that? And he said, oh, it's Atari. And so I called Atari up and somehow I got in touch with their engineering department. And so I came in for an interview. I told them, I'd, you know, I'd like to interview. I'd like to see what's up. And they brought me in for an interview. And the thing, the thing that really bugged me at Hewlett Packard is because I, I did a lot of work on microprocessors in college, which was extremely unusual in the early 70s to have a lot of microprocessor experience in college. And, uh, and when I got to Hewlett Packard, that was all gone. And it became very boring. The programming they were doing at HP was not interesting to me at that time. And I, I kind of was missing you know, real-time uh, control programming on microprocessors. That, to me, is a really fun, challenging problem to solve. And so I found out that's what they were doing at Atari. Most people would go to Atari to make games, right? I went to Atari because they were doing microprocessor real-time control programming. The fact that it was games made it even better, but... That wasn't why. I mean, I didn't really care that I was making games. I cared that I was working in a more dynamic and challenging environment. And that was the thing that really appealed to me. So I interviewed with them, and after several rounds of interviews, they decided they didn't want to hire me because they thought I would be too straight and not fit into their environment. Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> not fit into their wild culture. But little did they know. <laughs> little did they know. And so I literally begged and cajoled and did everything I could and asked them, you know, what are their objections? Tell me anything, what the problem is. And I just sort of wore them down. And I took a 20% a cut in pay to go work at Atari because I really wanted to be there. And uh, I got to give uh, Dennis Coble is the guy who hired me. And I got to give him credit because, you know, he was saying, well, we're not sure. You know, you th I said, you know, believe me, I, th I think we'd be missing a really good job match you don't hire me. And uh, I talked him into it and he went for it. And then they gave me an assignment, which was Star Castle. And the first thing I did, this new guy, you know, was on probation and everything. The first thing I said was, you know, I think this game's going to suck. I said, I don't think we should do this game. I think I should do something, something else like a variant. And they let me go for it. And that's what became Yars Revenge. Yeah, I was going to say, because uh, so, um, what were the kind of features that you had to remove from that game, Star Castle, to kind of get it to fit on the card and fit into the memory? Oh, well, I mean, it wasn't so much getting it to fit in the memory as it was being able to make the display work anything like the way that game went. That was a vector graphic game, which wow. is the worst case scenario for doing stuff on the 2600, right? If you could just draw lines all over the place here and there, you can draw very few lines on the 2600, and you don't have many graphic elements or graphic objects and to do something with concentric circles that move on, on the VCS is just, it's a worst case scenario. It's a very poor utilization of resources. So I just told them, I said, you know, that's something that's so maladapted essentially to the machine's hardware, at least as I understood it at that point. And I just explained to him, I said, look, you know, you're going to have this and this stuff's going on here. And this is just, you know, it's, it's going to be really hard to make a bad game is basically the way it, way it, the way it looked. I said to him, I said, but I can take some of the play components and aspects of what you're trying to do and what you're trying to achieve and reconfigure them on the screen so that it's better adapted to the 2600, but it would be much, I think it would be much more playable. And he just said, go for it. I was lucky because had this been like two years later, then it would have been like the marketing people have said, no, no, you have to do that coin op game because that's what we're marketing. That's what we're selling is that game. So you can't do something different. Well, what was the culture like at Atari at that time? It must have been a very exciting place to be. It was outrageous. It was amazing. The culture at Atari was do anything you want to do, but put a fun game out. That was the culture. We could do anything. We did crazy stuff, wild stuff. 
but everybody who was there really wanted to make a good game. And so that's where the focus was. But it was, uh, it was a wonderful, creative culture with, I, I still, to this day, I believe it's one of the most amazing collections of talent I've ever been around. Well, I worked at 3DO for a while. Now, 3DO, I think, was a place that was, true, was probably one of the greatest accumulations of gaming talent in the history of the gaming industry. But I think they got so little out of it, it's really a shame. Hmm. Atari was probably the most, it was just my favorite collection of people that I've ever worked with. I've never been around a group of people that was as dynamic and stimulating and creative and entertaining. I mean, to a person, every, uh, virtually every single one of them, uh, as, as when I first got to Atari, that crew of people who were there then, that was an amazing group of people because there were a lot of very technologically astute engineers but they were also creative people and interesting personalities. They were just everything. So you have people who are very technically competent, extremely creatively focused, and they were all craftsmen or artists and stuff in addition to being technologists. And they were also dynamic, interesting personalities. It was just going into Atari every day You so looked forward to going in because something interesting was going to happen. You were going to have a talk with someone. You were going to run into some kind of interesting idea or play a fun game or a new concept. Something amazing was going to happen virtually every day when you went into Atari. And what a great thing that is in a workplace. Some massively creative people passed through the doors of Atari over the years. I mean, even guys like Steve Jobs and Steve Wozniak were there, I guess, a couple of years before you were there. But, I mean, it was um, just, like you said, it must have been just such an incredibly you know, vibrant place to be at. Absolutely. Vibrant is an excellent word for it. It is. The place was just buzzing with really positive and exciting energy. And this was, we were defining a new medium, right? You don't often get to do that in a life. We were, that only happens a few times in the history of humanity, right? So we were actually defining, we were redefining what television was and creating interactive entertainment. With Yars Revenge, um, you were one of the first designers to have your name credited on the actual game, on the cart. I was actually the first one, yeah. Yeah, uh, was that kind of a significant change, like, you know, designers being appreciated yes, it was. more? Yeah, Yars Revenge was a game that was full of firsts. It was my first game, but I wanted this game to be a breakthrough game in every way I could possibly make it a breakthrough game. And it had a lot of firsts, but one of the firsts was it was the first time a programmer had been credited on the cartridge. And that had been a, a, an issue. There had been people who left over that. There had been other people who had had major uh, conflict with management and people over that before. Nobody had ever done it before. Uh, I was able to do it. The reason it came about was because another first for Yars Revenge is that Yars Revenge was the first game that came out with a backstory. I mean, every game had some like trivial setting to it or whatever, but I, I created the name for Yars Revenge. And that's a whole nother story is the naming of Yars. But part of that story was that I wrote a backstory. I just spent one night and I sat down and I wrote like a seven or eight page science fiction story, establishing the characters and the setting and the motivation and everything for Yars Revenge. And then I submitted that to the naming committee. And so they adopted that, and then they decided what they would do is do a comic book. So this is another first, the first time there was ever other ancillary materials to go with a game, right? So they created a comic book out of that story to go with the card, and then they decided they were going to have credits because there's so much production going into this particular game. And so they showed me the credit list, and, and I saw someone else was credited for the story the comic book. And I said to them, Hey, what, how come I'm not credited for the story? And they said, look, you can only have one credit for the thing. What do you want? I said, well, I'll take credit for the game. <laughs> so, but, and so because there was credits on all that other stuff, they credited the game designer. And from then on, they started crediting the game designers and the game programmers, uh, on the products. 
And rightly so as well, because a, you know before that you just see Atari on like a cartridge, and to the gamers it was kind of an, an anonymous person behind it. But then when you started to learn whose games you liked, it made made it a lot easier to go out and buy the ones from that team or that person. Made a lot of difference, right? Now Atari didn't want that to be the case, because for one thing, Atari does want you to just buy a game because it says Atari on it and nothing else. But another reason Atari didn't want that to happen, it was the major source of the controversy, was that people outside didn't know who the programmers were. If you started advertising who the programmers were, people might want to steal them. And Atari felt they were protecting themselves by not letting that information out. Turns out people who really wanted to find out were able to find out who the programmers were. It wasn't that hard to do. So. <laughs> I don't know if it was a successful strategy, but that was part of their thinking. Also, Atari really wanted the corporation to be first. They didn't want it to be like a rock star operation. They wanted it to be like a Disney studio, where you don't know who did what. You just know it's a Disney production. They wanted this to be an Atari production. And that's what they wanted to achieve. Activision kind of blew them out of the water with that. We did kind of tease on um, the name of Yars Revenge. I mean, what was the story behind that name then? Because it was quite unusual. Okay, so here's the, here's the story of the naming of Yars Revenge. Originally, it wasn't Yars. Originally, one of the things that I felt had to be a part of, of this game was a really spectacular payoff sequence. You know, every game has, like, you beat the boss and you get the big payoff, hmm. right? And the boss, you know, destroying the Kotile is, that's the payoff. And I wanted it to have a full-screen explosion. No one had ever had, like, a full-screen explosion before. And I wanted to have a big payoff. So originally I had a whole animation sequence design and it was going to progressively move across the screen and everything would freeze. And the, and the working title I had for this game was Time Freeze because it's going to be when you destroy the monster, you're frozen time and everything goes crazy. So, and as we got closer and closer to the actual release and I got more realistic about what I could and couldn't do in a big sequence, so I had simplified it to just this big full screen explosion. And so... Then they were going to name the game, and I thought the names they were coming up with were pretty lame. So I decided I need to get involved in the naming. So I talked to one of the product managers, and, and I asked him, you know, are their names under consideration? He goes, yeah, they're thinking about it. I go, have they made a decision yet? He goes, no. I said, well, can I make a submission? Can I make a submission for the name? And he's like, sure. You know, if you want to, go ahead. I told him, okay. So this was like mid-afternoon. I said, come back here tomorrow. I will have a submission for you for a name for the game. So that night I stayed in my office all night and I started thinking, I started making up stuff and I was thinking what to do. So, because I had my own agenda also, I was like, one of the things I thought was, you know, a dream of mine, a dream that I've always had is to add a word to the English language. I always thought it'd be really cool to add a word to the English language. That's just something I've just always wanted to do. And I thought this could be my opportunity because if I, if, you know, whatever I name this character, if the game becomes really popular, that that term could become common parlance. And uh, so I thought, here's my chance. So I try to think of what what's a name. I'm going to make up a name. What's it going to be? And when you just try to make up a word, when you try, I don't know if you ever tried to make up a new word, but usually everything you say sounds stupid because yeah. it's a word that doesn't exist. It's made up. So I gave up the idea of just plain making up a name out of thin air. And I started to think, you know, what I need is I need a, a code. I need some sort of a key as to how to make up the name. And so I started to think, and then the idea of spelling things backwards, I always liked that idea of things being backwards and forwards. So uh, I started to think of names, and I thought, oh, you know, a good name at Atari was Ray Kazar, because Ray Kazar was the CEO of Atari at the time. So Ray spelled backwards as Yar, and Kazar spelled backwards as Rayzak. So I decided to make it the Yarian Revenge of Razak 4. And Yar will be the name of the character, and Razak will be the solar system it takes place in. And then I wrote that story, the Yarian Revenge of Razak 4. And, and the game would be Yar's Revenge because that's what's going on. It's like, you know, this is, it's a revenge thing because I thought revenge is a great title word. Everybody wants revenge, right? So I got a title, a title character name and revenge, and I thought, that's a good title. And then I thought, to make it stronger, I'll, I'll write a whole story, because a, story, a, a name and a story is stronger than just a name, in my opinion. So I wrote that thing all night, and then you know, when, the, when the secretaries came in in the morning, I gave them like all my pages and had them type it up, and then the product manager shows up, 
And then I had my whole submission package for him. I said, here's the name and here's the story. Here's a, I got even a story to go with it. And he's like, oh, okay. So he takes that over. Then the next day I run into him and I go, hey, is the name in? And uh, he goes, yeah, yeah, it's under consideration and stuff. And uh, <clears throat> he goes, don't make a decision soon, probably. I said, oh, okay. And then, and then I did what I thought was my own little marketing campaign where I thought I'd seal the deal. So I said to this guy, I said, look, uh, I said, I'd like to share a secret with you, but I don't want this to get out because I don't want it to influence the naming of the game unfairly. And he's like, okay. I said, so you promise you won't say anything if I share this with you? He goes, absolutely. I won't say a word. I said, okay. I said, you know, the Yar's Revenge? I said, you know, Yar? You know, what's that backwards? And he goes, uh, Ray. And I go, yeah. And I go, you know, Ray Zach, where it's all set. I said, what's that backwards? He thinks for a second. He goes, uh, uh, Kazar. He goes, oh my God, Ray Kazar. He goes, does Ray know about this? I go, of course <laughs> Ray knows about this. You know, I wouldn't do something like this if Ray didn't know. I said, that's why I don't want you to tell anybody. Because I don't want it to unfairly influence the title. He's like, ah, oh, okay. Okay. And then I said, so, so I, I swore him to secrecy a couple more times and then he took off and went back to uh, marketing. So at this point, I know three things. I know, first of all, the first thing he's going to do is run back and he's going to tell everyone that, you know, that it's named after Ray Kazar. I also know that nobody in marketing is going to have the balls to try and talk to Ray about any of this anyway. And that's a good thing because the third thing I know is that Ray has no idea about any of this. I just pulled all this <laughs> stuff out of my ass with nothing to do with him. Amazing. So, and that was it. And so the next day, the day after that, I could, guess what? We're going with yours. We're going with yours. With us. Oh, great. That's fantastic. That's great. And uh, it was a great thing. And then months later, there was, uh, we were doing a press uh, demo and I was sitting there playing Yars on a giant screen TV and we're sitting there and Ray Kazar is walking around. He comes up to me at one point. He goes, Hey Howard. You know, I said, yeah, I said, uh, he goes, I heard what you did about the name for the game for Yars. <laughs> oh yeah. I said, how'd you like that? Right. And he goes, you know, he goes, just keep making games, Howard. <laughs> <laughs> just keep making games. And, uh, it was, Pretty funny. I had some interesting interactions with Ray Kazar. Yeah, that's an amazing story, though. Cause, I mean, you know, the name Yars Revenge probably wouldn't have made it past any marketing department. All the names were like, you know, Space Invaders or really like logical names, weren't they, before that? Exactly. And that's what they did, you know, a noun and a verb or something, you know. Yeah. <laughs> like, that's what they would do or throw an adjective in there sometimes. Well, I heard with that Crazy cookies. <laughs> well, I heard with that game, Time Freeze, I mean, it, when it was initially tested, was it, it was a very popular game with females. It was. Well, Yars Revenge was also probably one of the most tested games in the history of Atari mm. because there was someone who was trying to kill the game. I'm not sure why or what the whole thing behind it was, but there was someone who really had problems with the game, possibly because it was a very successful game or it was doing well. But the game was kind of flattering, and then we made a couple of critical changes to it, and then suddenly people really loved it. People were really liking it, but there was someone who was against the game. And so every time the game would come up, we'd go, okay, so are we going to release Yars? What are we going to do with it? And they'd go, well, we have some uh, playability considerations that we're concerned about, so we need to do more testing. So they would put it in focus tests, and it would do great. they go, okay, so let's do it. And then there's another test they want to do. There's always some other test or some other thing, and I'm waiting to release my first game. And it's like people from CoinOp would come over and play games. They loved it. All, everybody loved this game. Right. People just thought it was a great game. And I'm thinking I want to be someone who has a game out on the shelves. I want to be, you know, a, a, a game developer who's out there and and it wouldn't go. So finally, they commissioned a play test. So a play test is the big test. It's the biggest test they can do. And what a play test is, they bring over 100 people in. And they play two games. They play your game, the target game, and they play a control game. And then they rate both the games. Okay? So the game you test against is, has a lot to do with how your game does. Right? So you don't want to test against a really good game if you can help it. But I don't get to choose who I test against. So we get, a, we get the news, and here we go, and, 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 and we're coming up to the play test. Then I find out the game they're going to test Yars against is Missile Command on the 2600, the single most popular game, the probably the best game on the 2600 at that time. 
And I think, I'm really screwed now. I couldn't believe it. And so, and the test was in Seattle and I flew up for the test. I was going to be there right in the booth all the time. I wanted to see this go. And I watched the sheets as they came through. I was tabulating them myself. And the first sheet that comes in was a pretty low rating for yours. I thought, I'm screwed. I'm totally hosed now. People kept playing, they kept testing, and when the smoke cleared, that first sheet that I saw turned out to be the lowest rating that it got for any of them. Every other sheet was, was, was solid, and in the, when the smoke cleared, Yars Revenge had actually beat Missile Command in the play test. It scored higher than Missile Command. And I'm like, seriously? You know, can we release it now? You know, it's the, it was the highest testing game ever seen in testing. It got the highest score ever. And it was like, okay, so now they're finally going to release the game. And one of the interesting things about that test was indeed that if you look at, you know, men, you look at men and boys and women and girls, all four tested, right? And Atari had this whole thing that they really wanted to pursue bringing women into the market and making games that women would like. And so the group, it tested high in all the groups. But the group that actually tested slightly higher in was adult women. So here was a game, not only it's a high testing game, but it appeals to adult women. So it's like, here's the game that does everything you guys say you want a game to do. Come on, you know, let's put it out there already. So they released it. And then the commercials were all aimed at like 10 year old boys. And I went to the marketing people and I said, and this gives you an idea of why there was a lot of conflict between engineering and marketing. <laughs> that, you know, I said to them, I, you guys wanted stuff for adult women. They go, yeah, we do. And I said, well, this game tested highest with adult women. Why don't you market it to adult women? And they said, oh, uh, women don't like space shooters. Well. <laughs> and I said, but your testing shows they like this game. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's there. I mean, we actually have the numbers. They go, oh, women don't like space shooters. So it's like, really? <laughs> you don't believe your own testing? <laughs> you know? it's, that was just one of the things. But, you know, the thing is, when you expect things to make sense at Atari, that's when you're losing touch with Atari. Okay? <laughs> because Atari didn't make sense. Nothing made sense at Atari. And that's what made it such a cool place to be. Because it wasn't a sensible place. It was an outrageous place. It was a crazy place. So you'd see weird things here and there. You'd see unusual situations. And sometimes they would be really messed up like this. And uh, sometimes they'd be totally wonderful and crazy and unexpected. But Atari was, it was truly an amazing place to be. Well, uh, you left a little bit of code in there as well that was kind of something a little secret, uh, uh, early Easter egg. Right. Well, the, I, I also, another first for Yars Revenge was it was the first time uh, marketing released a game aware of an Easter egg in it. Because ordinarily, see, the Easter egg, the original concept for the Easter egg, as you're no doubt aware, is Warren Robinette, you know, put his signature in the adventure game. Everybody had a way of putting something, some secret thing or, or planting something in the ROM, putting your name in the ROM and ASCII characters at some point, doing something in the game. So, but the point of that was not to have an Easter egg. The point of that was to prove authorship. Because Atari was so much, didn't want anyone to know what games you did. They didn't want you to know you did games for them. The thing was, suppose at some point you wanted to demonstrate you had created a game. You wanted to have something in it that only you knew about. So if there was ever a question of authorship, you could demonstrate your authorship by showing there was something in there that obviously no one else would ever have put in. Right? That was the idea of Easter eggs as done by Warren Robinette. What I did was try to sell marketing on the idea that, you know, this can be metagaming. This could be something that players can look for and it'll have more meaning. And so I created an Easter egg because I was definitely going to sign the game. There was no way I wasn't going to have a signature in the game. I put signatures in all my games. But this one, what I decided to do is make the signature HSWWSH. And the idea was that when you discovered this and you figured out Howard Scott Warshaw is the maker of the game, so why is it HSWWSH? 
Oh, because it's telling you to take things and turn them around backwards. And that's what tells you that Yar is actually Ray and Kazar is Ray and Razak is Kazar. And it was an idea of revealing the code of the game of the naming of the game. So that may have been more thinking than really needed to go into it. But <laughs> that's, that's how I approached it. And finding an Easter egg in the, you know, those days, pre-internet, you know, if magazines didn't print it, it was all just word of mouth as well. It was very exciting. Exactly. And people forget, yeah, this was the pre-internet age. So uh, things didn't just pop out. You didn't have instant reviews. You didn't know right away how the game was doing. And you couldn't release updates. Right? You know, so when a game went out, it was out. People didn't download it. They had a buy hard product. And so there, you didn't rev a game. You know, there were no point releases. There were no bug fixes. You had a, it, what you put out went. Well, obviously, Atari managed to get the license for uh, Raiders of the Lost Ark, which was um, you know, the first video game uh, based on a movie. I mean, how did they get that license? From Spielberg. They negotiated with Steven Spielberg. And uh, they got that license, and then there was a question of who's going to do Raiders. And so they came to me, and uh, I said, sure, I'd love to do Raiders. I think that'd be cool. Though I really... I kind of wanted to do another action game. I wanted to do a sequel to Yars, but I put that off to do Raiders, but, but I wasn't going to get to do Raiders until Spielberg approved it, right? So whoever was going to do Raiders had to go uh, interview with Spielberg, and he had to approve them first. So I flew down to Universal Studios, and uh, to meet with Steven Spielberg. Now I'm coming from San Jose, which is, you know, like four or five, four, four like 400 miles away. And I flew in, got there for my 9:30 appointment, and uh, I show up, and there's the receptionist for Spielberg, and she says, "Oh, your meeting has been moved to 3:30 this afternoon," and I'm like. I flew here for this. I mean, we had this set up. I took a plane to come here for this interview. What do you mean? You've moved the interview six hours. I was like really kind of bugged. But then I thought, um, okay, so can you change my flight? Can you take care of all that stuff? And they said, oh, sure. Yeah, we'll take care of all that. I said, great. And then I said, you know, cause I'm, I'm a long time movie TV buff. I mean, I was one of the kids who would watch, six hours of TV a day and seven, if there was something good on, you know, it was like, I watched a lot of TV. I was all about movies and stuff. And here I am on the Warner lot with like six hours to kill. I just said to them, is it okay if I just, uh, cruise around the studio and, uh, you know, see what's up. It was universal actually, I think. And, uh, they said, sure. So I got to spend a full day walking around these studio grounds unescorted okay. <laughs> walking on and off the of sound stages. I got to eat in the commissary with all these people and all their just costumes and stuff. I, for, for a movie buff and TV buff like myself, it was an amazing, amazing day. I even got to steal a little flower off the set from uh, fantasy Island, Oh wow! which is a show I used to enjoy. And uh, it was just, it was an amazing day. And then at the end of all that, if I got to go cruise, get my, myself my own behind the scenes tour of the studio, then I get to meet with Steven Spielberg in his office. And we sat and we chatted and we talked and I showed him Yars Revenge and we played some of that and he was kind of digging everything. And then at one point I said to him, you know, Steven, I have this theory that you're actually an alien. I said, would you like to hear it? <laughs> and so he goes, sure. And so, and then I explained to him this whole story about that I have in my head about how I figure, you know, if we're going to be contacting aliens soon, the aliens are probably smart enough not to just show up like in a lot of movies and just land in a spaceship. I figure they're probably smart enough to send an advanced team to culturalize the planet to prepare us for them. And I said, and I figured that basically, you know, he was the production arm of this team that he was sent here to make films because they knew film was an easy way to communicate with people on earth. And what he's done is he's made films. He's one of the first people to make films that are really showing aliens as our friends and people, you know, who are, we can be sympathetic with and not be afraid of. 
And he made movies like that. And I said, and then the marketing arm of the people who are there, they make sure that these movies are seen all over the planet in every language to get everyone used to the idea that aliens are not so bad and be ready to meet them without having to kill them right away. And so I just said, I figured he was part of the aliens advanced team to culturalize the planet and that we're probably getting ready to meet the aliens very soon. And so and that's my theory about how you're an alien. And I think he really dug that. I think that had a lot to do with why I got to do the game. <laughs> and, and he totally dug that. And then he called, uh, he was interviewed by Games Magazine at some point later on that year. And he told them about this and they called me up to get the quote. And I ended up getting quote of the month in Games Magazine for calling Steven Spielberg an alien. So that was kind of cool. I bet nobody else had ever done that to him before. I don't know, but he, he certainly didn't say, oh, I hear that all the time. <laughs> you know? I don't know how many people explain that he's an alien to him, but uh, yeah, I don't know. But that's what I thought. You know, that was just an idea that I had. So I thought, you know, why not share it with him? Was he much of a gamer? Oh, he was very into games. He was very into games. He loved the idea of the technology. He was, he was another like amazing creative person. You know, Spielberg was just, he is someone, the way I put it is he has the eye of a child. And what I mean by that is his, his way of looking at the world is unfettered by a lot of bullshit that we go through as we get older and quote, grow up. <laughs> and he really has this innocent view and way of looking at things. And I think when he looked at technology and games and display technology and things like that, what he saw in it was the potential to really create new, exciting stuff. I think that's where he came with it. And so he enjoyed games, but I think he really enjoyed the excitement of new technology and where you could go with that, where you could take that in movies, where you could take it in storytelling. There was a lot of things you could do with it. And I think that was very exciting to him, as it was to all of us. And that is where we leave part one of our interview with Howard. Next week on the Retro Hour podcast, the full inside story of the worst video game ever. We'll find out what exactly happened, the true story of E.T. Make sure you check out part two of our interview with Howard Scott Warshaw next week on the Retro Hour podcast. <laughs>